So if you know about soccer, you will agree with me that it is extremely rare to win a soccer game with only six or seven players on your team. Having fewer players put you at a very big disadvantage. However, there have been times in lower level soccer matches where teams with fewer players have won because they were determined, because they worked together as a team, even though there were quite a few on the team. And one example happened in 2002 in the Cook Highland. There was a team called Nikao Sokatak. And they, they only had six players on the field. And the other team, which was known as Tupapa Marairenga, scored a goal early in the game. But Nikao Sokatak made an amazing comeback, even if there were quite very few and scored two goals to win 2-1, even though they had um, away fewer players. Now, this example shows how players can overcome challenges on the field and work together as a team, even when they have fewer, fewer and people on their team. Now, you'll see that what is going on here is quite the same with what we've just from reading uh, from the book of Judges chapter Chapter 7, Gideon won the battle with an army that went from 32,000 soldiers to just 300 men. They were reduced in two stages. There were 32,000 initially, and they were reduced in two stages, and they became 300. And they won a battle against an enemy army of about 135,000 in number. This is crazy. This is amazing. Now, you can even see how the narrator of the story describes the army, the enemy of Gideon. He, he uses metaphorical and hyperbolic language to describe them. Look at chapter 7 and verse 12. And the Amalekites and the, and the, and the Midianites and all the people of the east lay along the valley. He uses like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number. So he uses this metaphorical language to describe how numerous they are, the way. And this is unbelievable, standing against an army of 135,000 when you are just 300 men, and they won the battle. This is not a fairy tale, dear friend. This is true story that we read in Judges chapter 7. By the way, just before I go any further, let me give you a little bit of the structure of the book. The book of, of Judges has got a very special structure. First of all, you get uh, the, first, the first parts of the book, which is just the introduction, chapter 1, all the way to chapter 3, and the end of the book, chapter 17 up to chapter 21. But the most significant section of Judges is the middle part, is the middle section, chapter 3, verse 7, all the way to chapter 16, 31, beginning with Judges like Othniel and ending with Samson. That middle section is the most significant part of the book of Judges. This middle part has what we call a repeating pattern. How does it start? It begins, people do something wrong before God, and they get punished, and then they say sorry to God, and then God sends someone to save them. It's more like a pattern, more like a cycle. It's like a cycle of people turning away from God and getting in trouble, getting saved, and then having peace. This is the pattern you get in the middle section of the book of Judges. Now we have come to the story of Gideon which is actually the longest, the longest uh, story in all the judges, followed by the story of Samson. This is the most important piece in that pattern, chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. And I suggest that it becomes more like a key to help us understand the whole pattern that we get in the middle section of the book of Judges. Because when you read 
clearly and carefully, you will notice that the, cycle, the cycles are actually seven in total. Just before Gideon, we have three cycles already. And then after Gideon, we have three more cycles. And me, the story of Gideon is just in the middle. And it is in the middle intentionally put there by the writer. So you will see that at this point now, when you read at the beginning of chapter 6, the Israelites did the same thing. They went through the same pattern. They did what was wrong in the sight of the Lord. And then the next thing God punished them. He handed them over into the hands of the Midianites and the Amalekites and other uh, people who were in that coalition. And they stayed under that oppression for about seven years. And then they said sorry to God. They cried out to the Lord seeking for help. And so God chose Gideon in chapter 6 to save them. And the story of Gideon is significant. Why? Because this is now a turning point in the pattern. The pattern, the cycle that we've just said. The cycle is about sin. Then it is about punishment or judgment from God. And then it's about repentance when they, re they, repent, they repent before the Lord. And then after repentance, the Lord raises somebody to come and deliver them and then eventually give them peace. But the story of Gideon, Gideon tells us a little bit about the quality of judges. The judges that we have, they are all in number, 12. But if we include also Deborah, there will actually be 13. Last week you heard the song of Deborah. For those of you who believe that Deborah was one of the judges, then we can count a number of 13 judges altogether. But what you see here is that we already have three cycles of judges coming before, before uh, Gideon's story and three more cycles after Gideon's story. And intentionally, the writer has inserted the story of Gideon in the middle for a reason. Why? Because Gideon, the way it is presented in the story, when you read carefully all these three chapters, Gideon is presented in both good and not so good ways. Why? Because he is kind of in the middle of this pattern. The judges, almost all the judges before Gideon were mostly seen in a positive way. They were seen as good. And all the judges that come after Gideon, they are all presented in a negative way. They are not so good. But Gideon is just in the middle. Being in the middle is a bit of both. Is at the same time presented in a more negative way and at the same time presented in a more positive way. That's why I suggest that the story of Gideon, Gideon is a key to understand the pattern that we get in the story uh, in the book of Judges. However, when we get back to chapter 6, when Gideon is called by God and is chosen by God as the deliverer of the people under the oppression of the Midianites, you will be surprised that the writer has intentionally described the story of Gideon as Moses. Gideon is presented as the second Moses when you read it carefully, especially considering his calling. In the eyes of the writer of the book of Judges, Gideon is the second deliverer, is the second Moses. The way God called Gideon is almost the same that God called Moses. There are some small differences, of course, but the overall conversation that is going on between God and Gideon is almost the same as the calling of Moses. I tend to believe that for the writer of the book of Judges, Gideon is the second Moses. Because what you get actually in the calling in chapter 6, you'll see something that God calls him first. Gideon is called, and then he begins to express some kind of doubt, just like Moses when he was called by God. He came up with a number of excuses altogether. This is what Gideon also does in the story. And what God does after that is to reassure him that he's going to be with him, just exactly what God did with Moses. And then eventually Moses needed a sign that the Lord was with him. Even Gideon also is requesting for a sign. And then in this, this way, the narrator wants the reader to get Gideon as the second Moses, even if he's presented in both good and not so good ways. Now, this sermon in chapter uh, is focused in chapter 7, as I said earlier on, 
we have seven movements in the story. Uh, I suggest from seven, uh, verse one, all the way up to verse eight is the first movement. And I want us to look at three important truths that we get from the story. And we are reading this story after the cross. We are reading this story after the Lord Jesus has come, after the Christ events, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are using Jesus Christ as the key to unlock the mystery of Judges chapter 7. Three things that I want to share with us this afternoon in the story of Gideon, especially chapter number 7. Number one, I think what God wants to teach the Israelites, Gideon, and us today, is that do not boast to God. Do not boast to God, but express your need for him. Express your need for his grace. Acknowledge that you really need God. Acknowledge that you need his grace. Do not boast to God, but express your need for his grace. That's the first thing that I see strongly coming in this text, chapter 7, all the way from verse 1 to verse 8, which is the first movement in the chapter. The second movement, verse 9 up to verse 18, I think the second truth that we'd like to get from this passage, which I believe, is that God is telling Gideon and the Israelites and all of us to say, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, but you must be reassured in your faith. Do not be afraid because I am with you. I am the one who fights for you, but be strengthened in your faith. And the third one, which is part of the third movement, is what God is telling the Israelites is that do not expect simply a miracle, but play your part. Do not expect simply a miracle, but play your part. These three things I want us to look at. Let's go to the first one. Do not boast to God, but express your need for his grace. That from verse 1. In verse 1, you can see that the narrative begins with the mention of the locations Actually, the two armies are described. The army, or the army in inverted comma, I'll explain in a minute, the army of Gideon, and also the enemies of the people of God, uh, the Midianites, in, in chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. And the narrator goes on to mention the locations where these two armies were actually camping from. Have a look at verse 1. You will see that the people that were with Gideon in chapter 7, verse 1, they were with him, they rose early, and they encamped beside the spring of Harod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. So we have two camps here. We have two camps, the camp of the Midianites, the Amalekites. We also have the camp of, the, of Gideon and his people. We can call them an army, although it's not an army, we shouldn't think of uh, uh, a constantly armed, well-trained people here or cohesive fighting unit. But this is just a collection of males from each clan who were capable, at least, of bearing arms. These are the people that we call the soldiers of, uh, of Gideon. They were not very much trained, were not experienced at all. He just picked them randomly, all of them come, and then he, 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 he actually influenced them to go for battle. They were not very much trained. How many were there in total? 32,000. But it's interesting to see where they were actually located. I think there's a play of words in chapter 7, verse 1. They were located in the, in the spring of Harod. And the word Harod has a connotation of fear, a connotation of uh, trembling, something like that. For two reasons, maybe uh, why the narrator has actually mentioned the place where they were. Because the name Harod means trembling. And maybe in reference to the bubbling up of the natural spring, water in the cave where the spring originates. But mostly, there's a play of words. Trembling also resonates with the process of clearing out those men who were afraid. Have a look at verse 3. And the words of, of Gideon when he's talking to, uh, he's trying to clear and reduce the army in verse 3. This is what he says. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people saying, whoever is fearful. In Hebrew, the word fearful is herod. 
is the, quite the same as the place itself where they were harrowed. This is a place where the army of Gideon, actually the majority of them, were trembling, were in fear. They were not actually ready enough to go for battle. That's where they were. Even Gideon was actually afraid. You'll see later on God will ask Gideon whether he's afraid. So because they are in this place, Harold, which means trembling, which means fear, and what the narrator is suggesting that the whole army in general, they are actually afraid to go and fight. What about the Midianites? The Midianites are located in a place which is named More, actually More in the valley. And again, when you see this place, probably what it means, it means uh, oracle giver, oracle giver. The suggestion here uh, is that it's a place of spiritual inquiry. It's a place where these people have come together and meet to inquire from the gods and uh, whether they will win the battle or not. But they were very confident enough uh, because of the place itself, the place of inquiry, the spiritual uh, place for them. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the story of Saul, King Saul, just before he died, it is actually very close to this place where Saul went to inquire from a medium about whether he's going to manage his life as a king or not, just a night before he died. It is around this area, a place of inquiry. This is where the Midianite and the Amalekites were actually sit. But right from the beginning, the Lord comes in now to prepare these people and teach them the first the truth that I've just said, that they shouldn't boast. They shouldn't boast to God but they should always express their need of God, their need of God's grace. Look at verse 3. The Lord comes in. Instead of increasing the number, but goes, he goes on to reduce the number in two stages. In verse 3, God reduces Gideon's army. You know, first of all, by using Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1 and 9, one of the laws uh, of, the, of war. This is what it says. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to, the, to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellow melt like him, his own. This is one of the rules of war that we get. This is what God is telling uh, Gideon to do at the first stage of reducing the army in verse 2. In verse 3, God says, Now therefore proclaim, to the ears of all these people. Whoever is fearful and trembling, just like the place where they were, let him return home and hurry away from the Mount Gilead. Surprisingly, look at the number. There were 32,000 in total. But when this phrase of, was proclaimed to them, 22,000 at once out of 32,000, 22,000 of the people returned. They were all fearful because fear is contagious. It can contaminate the other people around. They all went back. And Gideon was very much concerned with the remaining. And God comes again and said the number is too, is too big. The second stage now, God goes on to reduce the number from 10,000 to 300 men. This is, this is crazy. What is God trying to teach them? What is God trying to tell them? And the reason is actually given there. It's very clear, isn't it, in the passage. Look at that verse again. In verse 3, the Lord states the reason why he's reducing the army from 32,000 to 300 men. The Lord is very clear. Look at what he says in verse 3. Whoever is fearful, in verse 4, sorry, and the Lord said, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them there. For you, there, and anyone to whom I say to you, I say to go with you, they will go with you. The one who say he shall not go, he shall not go. But the reason is so that these people may not boast to God that they did not need God in their battle. This is very clear in the passage. You can see that very clear in verse 3. Now you can see the reason in verse 3 again is that it was the Lord's purpose to teach Israel this 
memorable lesson of depending on him. You must depend on me. You must not depend on the size. You must not depend, you must not depend on, on your soldiers and the strength that you are. I want to teach you the laws in that you always need my grace. You always need me. You need me to be gracious to you so that you can win the battle. Sometimes when you read, you might think that maybe God is trying to get credit of the battle for himself. This is just something secondary. This is not the main point. The concern of God in reducing the army is to prevent Israel from boasting. To me, this is very clear in verse 2. It's reducing the, the army to the point where they realize that they need God. They need his grace. What God does not want the people is to claim that their victory proved that they had no need of Yahweh. They have no need of his power. God wants them to realize that they, you need me. You need my power. You need my grace all the time. Now, this statement does not negate humans a role to play in winning battles or deny them potential complement for faithful obedience. Now, when Yahweh's people are faithful, you'll see that even in chapter 5 of the book of Judges, when Yahweh's people are faithful, they even share in glory with God, just like in the time of Deborah. But what is in view in this passage when God is reducing the number is trying to prevent them from pride. He's trying to prevent them from autonomy, to say we can manage on our own. We can manage to go without you, God. We do not need you, God. And God has gone as far as reducing the number so that they realize that they actually need him. They need that undeserved favor from God. The grace of God is something you need. This is one powerful truth that God wanted to communicate to them. You actually need me. You cannot stand by yourself. I need to be with you. I need to give you my grace and my power and my strength so that you can manage. Because you see later on that people would always want to get great credit, the one that is actually for God. The critical point of this battle, you will see uh, later on, the critical point of this is not the outcome. But it is whether it is going to glorify Yahweh or it is going to glorify the servant, the human servant. This is the point. And God wants to get the glory at the end of the day and want to teach the people how much they need him more, how much they need his grace more. Not boast, dear friends. We should not boast. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter your achievements, God wants us to know that we need him. We need his grace. There's always a point where God will actually squeeze you so that you get the truth right, that you need me. There's no one who can come to him in terms of salvation. There's no one who can come to him by his own efforts. We need this God in his grace to bring us back to himself. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul says, it is by grace that you have been saved. It's by grace alone and through faith so that no one should boast. And this is not from you, it is from God. Human beings always want to get something to present before the Lord that they may actually be able to boast about. The memorable truth, the memorable truth that we get from this section is that we should never boast because God is the one we need in our lives. You need him for salvation. We need him for anything. God is there as our power, as our grace. This is very clear. This is the first point that we get from. Do not boast, Gideon. Whenever you get a battle, uh, whenever you win the battle, remember you need me. The second thing that we see in the passage now, which is very interesting, God is now encouraging us. Do not be afraid, but be reassured in your faith. It's just the way the Lord does it because the Lord realizes that this man also is just like the other people. Gideon is just like the Israelites. He's also afraid. He's also scared. But the Lord uses certain means and ways to encourage him. Look at verse 16. It is amazing that God uses a dream, a dream of one of the enemies. He tells Gideon, rise this night and go to the Amalekites, and go to their camp, and then you will hear what they are saying. The reason is, is stated in the passage is because somewhere, somehow, he was afraid, he was scared. 
He was not ready to go. And God tells him, go now to the camp and hear what they are saying so that you may be strengthened. You may be encouraged so that your faith may be reassured that I have already given you the victory. So be strong enough and do not be afraid. And they went down in, in verse 9. In that section, you may ask yourself, but why? It's because Gideon was afraid and God wants to strengthen him. Now what is remarkable here is how God has used, the means that God has used to strengthen him. It's a dream. It's a dream. And this tells us on how much God is sovereign. God is in control of events. God is in control of circumstances. God is in control of what is happening around us. He tells Gideon, go at this particular point this night. You'll hear what he is saying. And Gideon rises and go. And when, when he goes, he reaches at that particular moment, at the right time, he overheard someone telling a dream to his fellow friend. I believe, I am very sure I believe that this dream was actually planted by God himself. It is God who planted the dream in the mind of this man and then sent Gideon at the right time. And as soon as he arrived in verse 13, it was not coincidental. It was not by chance. I think God was behind the scenes. I believe God was the one who was actually orchestrating all of these events. And this, you can't miss the fact that God is sovereign. He's sovereign because he's in control of all the events of the world. He's in control of all the circumstances that are surrounding us. He's the one who planted the dream. He's the one who tells Gideon to go. And he's the one who gave the other fellow man the interpretation of the dream. At the right time when Gideon is just at the camp, he overheard the story of the dream and the gentleman gave the meaning of the dream which was actually giving courage to, to him. Listen to the dream in chapter uh, 7 and verse 9. This is a dream. Sorry. In verse 15, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream, the dream itself is actually um, in, uh, which verse is that now? Yes, verse 13. Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of belly, which was food for the poor people. Bread tumbled into the camp and Midian, and came to the tent and struck it so so that it fell down and turned upside down, so that the tents lay flat. This is a dream. And the gentleman was just close to him, brought the interpretation. This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into the, his and Midian and all his camp. There's no doubt that this is God doing. There's no doubt this is God who has brought the vision the dream and the interpretation. And upon hearing, he was strengthened. Gideon was strengthened and he went back to the, to the camp, encouraged the people to say, the Lord has already given us the victory. Now we can go. In this particular section, what I want us to get is the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He is in absolute control of whatever is happening. Things that we cannot see. God is working behind the curtain. God is, is working behind the scenes, things, things that you cannot actually see. Is there working? You don't need to peep into that, but you just have to trust that it is God who is working behind the scenes. I think what God is doing behind the scenes is none of our business. It is his business. All we need to trust that there is a powerful God who is working behind the scenes, who is controlling all what is happening. All we need is to trust this God, the power of this God, and the wisdom of this God. In his wisdom, he goes on to plant the dream in, his, in the mind of this man. In his wisdom, he is actually bringing a way of encouraging Gideon. And Gideon was very much encouraged as he went back. Believe that God is sovereign and trust him. Do not be afraid. Many times when we visit people who are trying to tell us that they peep into what God is doing, it's because we are afraid. 
Many times when we visit village witch doctors or we go to Ngangas and something like that, it's because as human beings we are afraid. It's because we don't actually see what is happening beyond the curtains. All we need to know that beyond the curtain there's God. And this God is powerful. He's able to control every single, every single event that is happening. Because God has hidden those things that he does behind the curtains, it's none of our business to know. All we need to know is to trust this God who is busy working behind the scenes and is working for the good of his people. For the good of Gideon, he planted a dream. For the good of his people, he, he gave the interpretation. For the good of Gideon, he sent him at the right time to hear. This God is behind the scenes and is working powerfully. All we need to do, do not be afraid. Trust that this God is working behind the scenes. This is what we get here. The sovereignty of God. All the small gods of the nations, all the idols that people worship, they are not in control of the events. You are not in control of the events. I am not. No wonder we fear. No wonder we are scared. But thankfully, we have a God who is great and powerful, who is working behind the scenes, who is controlling every single event, and is the one who is moving things up and down. He is able to use even evil to achieve his purposes. There is nothing that is actually beyond the control of this God. And we can see this is coming very clear in this passage that God, the God of the Bible, is a sovereign God. He is God who is controlling everything. You are here, you are discouraged because you don't know what is happening. I'm here to encourage you, dear brother and sister, that the Lord, the God you've actually put trust in, is not just a creator of the world. He is also busy working. Is working behind the scenes for the purpose of the goodness of the, the people of God. This, the sovereignty of God, is a clear truth of the Bible. God is moving everything. But let me pause here a little bit and ask a question. What about today? Does God still speak through dreams? Because this is a dream, actually, God is speaking. Does God still use dream to speak to us? There are so many answers that we can bring here. You know, some people say yes. And they believe in something they call continuationist view. They think God still talks to us using these special ways like dreams. But they also say it is important to make sure what we dream or what we see, they go in line with the, what the Bible says. We have people like John Piper, people like Wayne Grudem. They hold on this view. On the other hand, some people have a different view. Uh, they don't believe that really God continues to use these powerful means of communicating with people. They've got a view that is known as secessionists. They say that since God, since the Bible is complete already, uh, God has not used certain special ways to talk to us and those dreams because we have the Bible and it's all what we need. People like MacArthur and B.B. Whitfield, B. Whitfield, they believe that. And we have also other people who take at least the uh, middle of the road view, just in between, God and fee. They believe also that, well, uh, maybe God does sometimes use these special ways, you know, of speaking to people, but we should not rely too much on them. Uh, but whatever the case, that's not the point, whatever the case may be, the main thing that we need to grasp from this movement is that we need to remember that God oversees everything. He's in control of all the happenings in our lives, even around us, even in the world, even what is happening that sometimes you can say, oops, what is happening? There is no oops in God's language. Everything God does, he knows exactly what he's doing. God, you'll never be surprised by anything. We are all caught by surprise, but not God. The eternal God is in control of everything. I remember when uh, Trump lost elections, the evangelical movement in, the, in America where we're like, now things have gone beyond. Now, how are things going to happen in terms of the prophecy of everything? I said, hang on. God is, is in control. He knows what he's doing. God is moving all the uh, events of the world. There's nothing we can actually think of that God is not involved. Is God, the God of the Bible, is in control of everything. This is the point we need to get. Whether you believe that God still speaks to in dreams, whether you don't believe that, but that's not the point. The main point, just trust the God, the powerful God who works behind the scenes. 
and is encouraging us. And the last point I want us to get from this passage is that do not simply expect a miracle, but you must play your role. This is where we get now the human responsibility truth that we get. Listen to what Gideon does. As soon as he gets back to the, to the camp, he is encouraged. But he does not just move like that. He's got a strategy in place. He has a tactic in place. He uses a method in place to actually go and surprise the enemy. He does not just go to say, since God has given us already the victory, therefore we have to relax. We don't have to do anything. Then the victory will just come. No, he's got a role to play. On the one hand, we, we talk about the, 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 the sovereignty of God. On the other hand, we also look at the responsibility of a human being. You have a play. You have a role to play in the fight, in the battle, in the spiritual battle. We have something we can do. It's very interesting. We can notice that though God taught Gideon that he would be with him, although he told him that he would help him or ensure him with victory, but Gideon still uses some clever tactics in order to uh, to win the, the battle. This is what we actually need to do as believers as well. We need to know what is our responsibility. What is the role that I need to play to win the battle against the flesh, against the devil, against the enemy. There's something we need to do. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 up to 18, we are told to put on the armor of God. We are told to actually stand firm. This is something we need to do. We have a role to play. We don't have to leave everything in God's sovereignty, we are not robots. We are human beings, and we need to come up with mechanisms. We need to think of some tactics, some strategies, in line with the word of God as we move on. But this is not the, the greatest lesson we get from this section. I think the great lesson we get from sec this section is how God saved Israel through unconventional means. It's interesting to see how... Um, the enemies were running away from 300 men. 135 people, they were all defeated by means that were unconventional altogether. They just blew their trumpets. They used their torches. Something that you cannot use in the battle. Very unconventional, very unexpected. But that's what God used. I think this is a great lesson. Maybe the great lesson of all of this text. It is how God uses and usual, and usual method to actually bring about salvation. Friends, think of the cross. A great example of this is the cross of Jesus. God defeated all the enemies of humanity, sin, Satan, and the world by using means that are unconventional. The Son of God died on the cross. It is at a cross where justice and mercy meet. Think about it. The cross is the, is the most unusual way that God used to save his people. No wonder when you read in the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that it confused people. The, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the lost because it's unusual that God would use that particular means to save the people, his people. So don't forget this, dear friend. God likes to use ordinary, weak things to do amazing stuff. In fact, God chooses, chooses things that might seem silly to show that he is the real boss. God is the real boss of the universe. He will use you, even if you don't know how to speak, even if you are coming from a very poor family, even if you are actually disqualified by everybody, then you are qualified. In the eyes of this great God, he uses the weak vessels in order to shame those who think they are very strong. He is God who is the boss, the king of the universe. We must boast when we come before the Lord in the sense of the fact that God may use our weaknesses to bring about his victory. The cross was a strange idea for many people. But guess what? God uses it to save us. It's at a cross where we get our reconciliation with God. So take heart, my friends. God can use even the least powerful things to make a big difference in the world. God will use SEU to bring positive change. 
in many areas of life here in Zambia and beyond, as weak as we may seem to be, we trust the great God, the God who is in control of everything. He uses means that are actually unusual to bring about glory to him, so that by the end of the day, no one among us will be able to claim the glory. He does that. Through our humble beginnings, God uses us to push his kingdom far away. We are, we are so uh, fortunate to be part of this weak beginning. But trusting the God of the Bible is working behind the scenes. As Paul said, we should be proud of our weaknesses somehow. The cross might have seemed weird to some people, but it's how God showed his grace. In conclusion, dear friends, let us humbly acknowledge our dependence on God's of grace. Let us always express that we need we need him rather than boasting. Let us embrace our faith with confidence, banishing fear from our hearts. Let us always remember that in our spiritual journey, we have a role to play. And let us always remember that God can use us, can use you, can use me, can use weak means to bring about victory. Now listen to these words from the Apostle Paul. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it's pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ, Christ crucified, who is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God, guess what, is wiser than men. And the weakness of God, guess what, is stronger than men. Amen.